you. Um, <clears throat> so I've shown uh, two dualities already, uh, one due to Stone and one due to Gelfand. So this one is by uh, Lev Montriagin, who <clears throat> was a prominent Soviet era uh, mathematician. This is, un unlike the last two, it's um, a self-duality between, essentially between a certain class of groups and themselves. And one might wonder why would, if you look in the mirror and see the same thing, what's the point of looking in the mirror? So uh, it turns out that the secret of Fourier theory is locked up in this particular duality. So <clears throat> there's a lot of um, somewhat hard analysis to be uh, explained in this, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to show you a really toy version of Montreal's duality for finite abelian groups and connect it with the discrete Fourier transform rather than give you full-blown Fourier theory. <clears throat> I will say a bit about the setting in which the, the general theory is discussed, the theory of topological groups, and I'll introduce the notion of dual groups, and I think I'll try, I'm going to try and do a calculation that shows uh, duality between Z and the circle, so it gives you a feeling for how one goes between compact and discrete groups. And then I'll at least state uh, Montreal's duality in its, in its full glory. And I will make some remarks, which are probably not on the printed slides, about uh, Tanaka duality, because I'm sharing a flat with Mike Mislav, who said the only reason he came was to hear about Tanaka duality. <laughs> <laughs> so I added a slide about uh, Tanaka duality at the end there. <clears throat> okay, so this is a picture of Le Pontriagin. I couldn't find anything in which he was smiling, so uh, <clears throat> I'm also not very good with uh, resolution. So let's recall Gelfand duality. It's about compact Hausdorff spaces and commutative unital C star algebras. And if you look at the complex valued functions from compact Hausdorff spaces, you get the commutative unital C star algebra. If you look at the uh, maximal ideals here, you get a compact Hausdorff space if you topologize it in a suitable way. So this is what we did last time. <coughs> we have functors back and forth. Now, what? Yes, wait for the third lecture to miss beginning. Um, <clears throat> hmm, hang on, I think I need to relay check this or something. <clears throat> this is too bizarre. Um, sorry. <laughs> The dog ate my slides, yeah. The little green man inside here ate my slides. <laughs> yes, live latex informatics. Live latex. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll teach me to make slides during Samsung's talk. <laughs> <laughs> in preview. Let's hope it works in Adobe. a self-duality between a certain category of groups and itself. I don't think we need this silly hand here. <coughs> so as I said, it plays a key role in understanding the Fourier transform. <coughs> so the categorical picture is like this. We have the category of locally compact abelian groups. So these are certain algebraic things, but also 
there are certain topological things. So that's why we can say both uh, a top good topological adjectives as well as algebraic adjectives describing these things. So we have locally compact abelian groups. Uh, and the category is obtained by taking morphisms that are both homomorphisms as well as being continuous maps. And uh, <coughs> it turns out that you can construct a functor and what it will do is construct a new group called the dual group and you get essentially the mirror image of your original category as opposed to off of a different category. Okay, so that's why it's a kind of self-duality. It cuts down if you, instead of looking at all locally compact abelian groups, if you only look at compact abelian groups, then on this side, you will get discrete abelian groups. And if you go back from discrete abelian groups, you'll get compact abelian groups. So that's the <coughs> actually the form in which it's more often used. The canonical example of this particular phenomenon is when you take the circle as your compact group. So the circle is just the unit circle in the complex plane with multiplication of the group operation. And the discrete group that you get is the integers. So of course, you can see kind of traditional Fourier series embedded here because the function on the circle is nothing but a periodic function in the whole line if you unwrap the circle. And we know that such things can be expanded as a power C series in you know, e to the i theta with different ends. So that's of course can be decomposed into sines and cosines. So you get <coughs> Fourier series by going between these two things. Okay, so let me talk about finite abelian groups for a while. So a finite group with a single element, so that it's basically just the identity and then powers of a single element, is called a cyclic group. And the reason for this is if you kind of draw it on the plane, you're going around a regular polygon embedded in the unit circle, inscribed in the unit circle. So written in this way, it's clearly abelian. All you have are powers of a single element generator tau. And one typically thinks of them as groups of roots of unity. So you take the nth root of a certain, well, of one, and this gives you a certain complex number. And if you look at the powers of the complex numbers, we'll trace out a regular polygon inscribed in the unit circle. The importance of these cyclic groups, they seem very special, but it turns out that every finite abelian group is actually a direct sum of these cyclic groups. This is a powerful structure theorem that simplifies many things. <clears throat> so I guess it was late in the 19th century, people started studying characters, complex valued functions from um, the <clears throat> from, from uh, abelian groups into this particular abelian group. So this group is the non-zero complex numbers with multiplication. And that forms an abelian group. So of course we remove zero because that doesn't have an inverse, but everything else does. So you get a nice abelian group. You can often show that um, the maps into this have to be into the unit circle anyway. So quite often we'll actually just use the unit circle. So the unit circle is a subgroup of the complex numbers where you stick them as uh, to have modulus one. So if you take any abelian group, you can define uh, a character to be a map from G into this group. Okay, so sometimes people define characters to be only into the unit circle, sometimes they define it this way. Um, and I've written a question mark here because it's actually not only not clear, it's actually not even true. <laughs> but uh, if you know that G is compact, then indeed that turns out to be so, <clears throat> so you can uh, check that for yourself. So um, it's going to be fruitful, especially in the context of compact groups, to think about characters as going into the unit circle. All right, so it's a fun exercise if you already know this stuff to check that it is a compact group and this really does happen. <clears throat> so the point about characters, they look just like innocuous you know, functions, but they can be organized themselves into a group. So you define multiplication point-wise, and you get a group called the dual group, G hat. And G hat is also abelian because it inherits its abelianness from the top.
target. Okay, so you get from the group G another group G hat, which is also an abelian group. Now, if you take a cyclic group like Zn with generator tau, we have just n distinct characters. So this is easy to verify. Okay? And uh, the characters are just those. So you're basically <coughs> raising your basic generator to different possible integer powers. And these, these define the n distinct <coughs> characters that you can have. So in this case, the group is isomorphic to its dual group for cyclic groups. Definitely not the case for arbitrary abelian groups. Okay, so that's what I just said. <coughs> it's also true that <coughs> the dual of the product of two groups is the product of the duals. So it follows, using the structure theorem, that the, the order of a finite abelian group is the same as the order of the dual group. Now, we can state somewhat uh, pretentiously, you can call this Pontiac the duality, but it's actually a very simple thing. If, <coughs> so maybe this is a toy version. So if G is a finite abelian group, then there is an isomorphism, and it's our old friend, the evaluation isomorphism, that goes from G to the dual of the dual of G. Okay, so this is starting to look again like the very familiar thing, we've seen it once with Stone, once with Gelfand, and now the third time here, <coughs> you get an isomorphism like this. Okay, so it's easy to check that this evaluation map is a homomorphism. So just to remind you what this means, what it does is it takes a G, gives me an element of the double dual. What is an element of the double dual? It takes a map, namely a character, and assigns a complex number to it. And how does it do that? Well, it just takes the character and evaluates it on the G. Okay. So it's easy to check that this thing is a homomorphism and that it is injective. And by the counting that we did on the previous slide, it follows that it's in fact a bijection. Okay. <coughs> right. So that's kind of the simplest possible proof you can have of a, a <coughs> self-duality. So how does it hook up with the notion of Fourier transform. So if you take a finite abelian group, you can write L2 of G for the vector space of complex value functions on that group. Okay, so this is remember, <coughs> a finite group, so this is just two groups of complex numbers. And it is actually a Hilbert space simply because Cn is a Hilbert space, automatically complete. And so you can define an inner product in this way. Take uh, two of these characters alpha and beta, sorry, not characters, you take two of these complex value functions alpha and beta, and you define alpha star of g times beta of g, and you sum over all the group elements. Okay, so, again, these are finite groups, so everything is simple. So, what are we going to do when this is not a finite group? Well, we have to do something to replace the summation. <coughs> now, the characters are elements of L2 of g. They are functions into uh, <coughs> the unit circle. And an easy thing to check is that if you have two distinct characters, then their inner product is zero. And if you take the sort of the norm of a character, it will be the square root of the order of the group. Okay, so if you take the inner product of the character with itself, you get just the order of the group. And now it turns out you can define something reminds you of the Fourier transform. So if I take a function in L2 of G, I can define a new function in L2 of the dual group. And that's uh, <coughs> given by this formula. So you may, may have been used to seeing 1 over root mu pi's and stuff like that. That's roughly speaking the size of the unit circle entering into the picture. But you can see it manifesting itself here as the size of the group. <coughs> so I'm not sure if I've got all the square root signs right, but Never mind, but I'm not trying to calculate precisely. Okay, so the Fourier transform is actually closely tied up to the fact that you have this nice duality between a group and its, and its uh, character group. This map, of course, is a map between Hilbert spaces, and it's in fact an isomorphism of the Hilbert spaces. 
there's even a nicer thing you can do, <coughs> which is you can define an algebra on these things. You can make a multiplication operation, which is defined this way. I've written this, it's often written additively when you've got abelian groups, but I've written it multiplicatively like this. So you take a sum over all the group elements of this particular combination. Okay, so you may have seen this in the more continuous setting with kind of f of x and g of y minus x integrated over x. <coughs> Here, we've just done it this way. So starting with two of these functions in L2 of G, we can define a new function called the convolution of alpha and beta, defined by this simple formula. Okay, and this, <coughs> the grand theorem, which is again very easy to prove in the finite case, is that if you take the, the uh, Fourier transform of the convolution, you get the product <coughs> of the Fourier transform. So this is of course used very much in physics to simplify <coughs> complicated combinations and, and view them in the Fourier transform world as simple uh, uh, products. So this, of course, immediately proves that this is associative and commutative and distributes over plus. It tells you that you've got an algebra, <coughs> commutative unital algebra, in fact. Um, <coughs> and it's called the convolution algebra. OK, so now all this the reason it was so trivial is because it's just finite groups. You can just do summations without worrying about it. <coughs> and um, now you have to do some things in the <coughs> infinite case. So the topological generalization of the notion of finiteness is compactness, as I tried to argue yesterday. So we're going to look at uh, compact groups, or we can even loosen this and say locally compact groups. So locally compact means not that the whole space is compact, but at least every point has a compact neighborhood. So kind of nearby, at least, you can pack every point inside a compact neighborhood. Okay, so these are locally compact groups. So in order to even talk about these things, we need to put a topology on the group. And there's a, already an interesting interaction that happens between the algebra and the topology. And we need to replace, of course, those summations by some kind of integration. These are all the ingredients we need. And constructing these things is not at all easy. And certainly it's something I'm not going to attempt in the next 30 minutes. Okay, but I showed you what was done in the finite case so that you could believe that these are the corresponding structures you need to have in the <coughs> more general case. So let's define topological groups. A topological group is just a topological space that's also a group. So what could be simpler? So <coughs> the point is, you need some kind of coherence between these two structures. And we demand that the group operations, namely multiplication and inversion, are continuous in the topology. Okay, so that tells you it's not just an algebraic structure and a topological structure that have nothing to do with each other. They are required to interact. <coughs> so. Uh, finite groups can always be regarded as topological groups where we put the discrete topology on the group. So quite often I just talk about finite groups as if they were topological groups, but I always have in mind that they have the underlying discrete topology. And morphisms in this category are just uh, homomorphisms, but we're now also going to require them to be continuous. So continuous homomorphisms and <coughs> these objects give you a category of topological groups. Okay, so examples of topological groups are, of course, the uh, complex numbers with zero removed. So I believe this little superscript slash times symbol is the standard notation for the zero is removed. Um, our friends, the matrix groups, are, are kind of canonical examples of uh, topological groups. <coughs> algebra structure and the topological structure interact nicely. In fact, these are much more than topological groups. They also have smooth structure on them, and they're knee, knee groups. So what's this is topology you use on them? This one? Yeah, the matrix groups. Uh, the Euclidean topology? The Euclidean. Yeah. So you're just using them as a vector. C to the power n times n. Yeah. <coughs> so the the uh, matrices with determinant 1 give you a closed subgroup of GLN, and that's another very popular example of uh, a topological group. <coughs> uh, 
SL2C is beloved by physicists. Uh, <clears throat> the circle is an abelian topological group. When you're thinking of it through your Lee theory perspective, you often write it as U1. Physicists like to call it that. Uh, <clears throat> I, like to, I, I like to think of it as a circle, so I, I like to use the notation S1. So there are some interesting facts about these topological groups. Um, <clears throat> the first thing is that the topology is translation invariant. So if I take an open set and I shift it by the group action, either from the left or the right, of course that doesn't make a difference in the abelian case, but in the non-abelian case these concepts still make sense, this topology is translation invariant. So if I take an open set, I can move it anywhere by the group action and I'll still get an open set. Now, usually topological spaces don't have special points, but these are also algebraic structures, so there's a very distinguished thing called the identity. And it means you can more or less study the topology of the group by studying it in the vicinity of the identity. Um, also, U is open if and only if U inverse defined this way. So you simply take the inverse of every element, you get some other set that doesn't look like a translation at all quite distorted, so to speak, so, but that's also going to be open. If you take a subgroup of uh, G, then its closure will also be a subgroup. So this is telling you that another interplay between the topology and the algebra. <coughs> and here's um, a completely elementary fact, but perhaps striking the first time you see it. Every open subgroup is actually cloaked. So you take your open subgroup, and now you look at all the cosets. Because of what I said here, they're also all open. Okay, so the important point about cosets is that they're all disjoint. <coughs> so the complement of your open subgroup is a union of cosets. And those cosets are all open, and arbitrary unions of open sets are open. So the complement of your open group is, is also open. Hence, your open group is closed. Okay, so, as I said, completely elementary, but striking when you're first told it. <coughs> okay, so, uh, already, so notice this is not any old open set. Open subgroups are closed. All right. <coughs> if G is T1, so that means given a pair of points, there's an open set around one of them that doesn't contain the other, and vice versa, but not necessarily that you have a pair of disjoint open sets. That's the T2 condition, first problem. But in topological groups, actually, if you're T1, you're automatically T2. <coughs> and that will happen if and only if the singleton consisting of the identity of element of the group is a closed set. So you remember my remark earlier, you can kind of study the topology in the neighborhood of the identity if you want and, and glean things about the open space simply because once you're there, you can move around with the group action. So that's kind of nice. <coughs> it's always good to have two forces pulling your, your car, so here you have both algebra and topology working for you. <coughs> so from now on, I'm going to assume that being Hausdorff is part of the definition of being a compact or a locally compact group. I want to sit around and say, jump around and say, oh, it must be Hausdorff all the time. We had to do integrals to replace those summations. And this is perhaps one of the <coughs> technically challenging parts, is to show that you can construct a measure on the group that you can use for doing integrals. Okay, so you can make up all kinds of measures if you like. But again, you want a measure that makes also group theoretic sense. And that's our measure. Right? <coughs> so if you don't know any measure theory, you can just note that some sensible notion of integration can be defined on certain topological groups for hard measure. And if you don't know what it is, you can just be name dropping. But uh, if you do know some measure theory, let me say a few things. So we have a, a topology, so hence we have the sigma algebra generated by those open sets. That's called the Borel algebra. And the Borel measure is simply a measure associated with that particular algebra, the Borel algebra. So there are a number of conditions you can impose. One is called outer regularity. 
and we'll say that a Borel measure is autoregular if for any Borel set, the measure of that set is given by looking at the open sets that contain it, calculating their measure, and then taking the inf of all those containing open sets. Okay, so that means kind of approximating your arbitrary Borel set by simpler open sets from the outside and looking at their inf. Just to remind you of inf, but anyway, uh, <coughs> that's what you're doing. Inner regular is the uh, more or less the dual concept. You look at sets inside and kind of stretch them out. You take the soup in this sense. Now, uh, you don't take closed sets, you take compact sets in general. So that's inner regular and outer regular. Now, we have something called a radon measure, which also Bart has been talking about in detail. <coughs> so, this is a Borel measure that is finite on compact sets. Inner regular on all open sets and outer regular on all Borel sets. Okay. And so these are kind of sanity conditions that not every measure needs satisfied. But radon measures, actually most of the measures we use really are radon measures. We're just not told these things except as perhaps as propositions after the fact. <coughs> so now I can define what hard measure is. So if you take any topological group uh, <coughs> and uh, a radon measure, we say that this is a left Haar measure if for any group element and any Borel set, <coughs> it's translation invariant. So if I take the measure of E and then I shift that whole set by the action of a group element, then I preserve the measure. Okay. So right invariant would be if I had G on the other side. So roughly speaking, or not roughly speaking, Precisely speaking, our measure is a radon measure on the topological group that plays nicely with the group actions. Okay, so <coughs> as I said, the, one of the major technical difficulties is the construction of measure. And the uniqueness and existence theorem says that if you have a locally compact group, then G admits a left power measure. And furthermore, this measure is unique up to an overall scale factor. So of course, once you have a measure, you can multiply everything by 17. Uh, but that's basically the only ambiguity you have. Not just 17, but any uh, <coughs> number. So this measure is unique up to an overall factor. So that's very nice. It's telling you that um, it's basically canonical. And if you want to normalize the overall volume of the group in some way, which you can do if it's a compact group, uh, then, then it's absolutely canonical. <coughs> It doesn't really matter if you have if you're talking about left or right hard measures, because even if it's a, not an abelian group, it's the fact that if you have a left hard measure, that happens if and only if you have a right hard measure. Uh, now there are some facts that follow. Uh, one is that a non-zero hard measure is positive on all open sets. Furthermore, if you look at the overall volume of the whole group, then that's finite if and only if G is compact. Obviously, if, uh, if G is compact, that's going to be finite because that's part of the definition of being a radon measure. But in fact, it's an if and only if. Those are the only ones that have finite hard measures. Okay, so now we can do integration <coughs> on groups. And we can continue with our program on, that we had with finite abelian groups and try to, to do duality theory. So we'll define characters again. So a character of a locally compact abelian group is a continuous <coughs> group homomorphism from G to S1. Okay. Now the characters, just as before, form a group called G hat, the dual group, under point-wise multiplication, just as we had for finite abelian groups. Uh, <coughs> Now we make this into a topological space by using uh, a standard uh, topological construction called the compact open topology. This is actually defined it there in case you don't know what it is, but I'm reckoning if you don't know what it is, maybe that's not going to tell you to you. If you don't know what it is, you don't need to read it. <coughs> so we get a dual topological group, G hat. Okay, so before
before we had a finite abelian group, we got another abelian group, the dual group. This time we started with a topological group, uh, a locally compact abelian group, or a compact abelian group. We get a dual topological group. So, <coughs> this is again locally compact. <coughs> what I'm going to do now. <coughs> so, um, to make this, all this abstract stuff come alive, I will work through a very elementary example. So, of course, I'd like to prove generally that the duals of compact groups are discrete and the duals of discrete groups are compact. But rather than doing that in its full generality, I'll just look at a particular discrete group, our friend the integers. So this saying in the mathematics world, God created the integers. All else is the work of the other name. Um, <coughs> in the, and my example of the compact group is going to be just a circle. Okay, so just one very specific example of this duality between compact and discrete groups. So any character <coughs> of Z is determined by, by its value on 1. Because in fact, integers are generated by 1. <coughs> So any choice of a complex number in S1 gives you a character. Right? <clears throat> and uh, so the topology I'm going to skate over, but that's at least telling you that the, uh, <clears throat> at least as a group, the, cap the dual group is, is the circle. The second example, I mean, going the other way, the dual of the circle is the uh, <clears throat> integers with the discrete topology. So let me do that in some more detail. So uh, recall that by definition, chi of S1 is contained in S1. Actually, uh, did I say already that uh, if you take any compact abelian group, chi of that group, if I take a map from a compact abelian group into this, it's automatically got to be in there. Well, <clears throat> why, why is this true? So, this is a compact group, so chi of g is compact. And we can ask, well, <clears throat> what if I'm not mapping onto the circle? Well, what could happen? One of two things. I could be inside the circle or outside the circle. If I take any value in the group to some number whose modulus is more than one, then I keep iterating it, I'm not going to be bounded, am I? I'll just be shooting off to infinity. So <coughs> the image is certainly not going to be compact. And that's right. The other, if I take a number that's too smaller than one, and I keep iterating, I'll converge to zero. <coughs> and then, you know, because it's a compact group, I have a converging subsequence, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, <coughs> So it's not just randomly that I restrict it to being inside the circle. Now, <clears throat> so what can this character do? Well, let's uh, we recognize that a generic element of the circle can be written in the form e to the i theta, where theta is a real number. And it's going to some other point in the circle, so it'll be e to the i f of theta for some continuous function f. Why is f continuous? Because chi is continuous. Okay. And now you can observe a simple fact. If I look at e to the i alpha plus beta, then of course that's going to be f of alpha plus beta, because that's what chi is supposed to do. Um, but also, e to the i alpha plus beta is e to the i alpha times the i beta, that's the group operation, and chi is supposed to be a group homomorphism, so that must happen, and of course, that tells you that. So the bottom line is f of alpha plus beta equals f of alpha plus f of beta. This is a remarkable equation. It says Functional equation. <coughs> functional, not funky, but uh, it's a nice 
some number times x. Uh, provided, of course, f is continuous. Actually, you can weaken this quite a bit. <coughs> we could, it's true even if f is just required to be measurable. And I wasted a lot of time on completely useless uh, further puzzles by <coughs> constructing solutions to this Apart from this, when f is not measurable, <coughs> but, uh, that's purely time wasting. Anyway, <laughs> the point is, one can do this, and perhaps I even have this proof here. No, I don't have this proof here. Okay, so it's a puzzle for you. <coughs> so prove that it is equal to uh, f of theta is equal to lambda times theta for some real constant lambda. So what have we done? We've shown that chi of z is z to the power lambda, essentially. That's not good enough. I'd like lambda to be an integer. But now you see if I take, I can put any z in there, and I'm going to choose an nth root of unity. Okay? So chi of omega to the n is chi of 1. So that's of course equal to 1 because it's a homomorphism. And because it's a homomorphism, that's also chi of omega to the n. So aha, uh -huh, chi of omega is also an nth root of unity. Okay, so omega to the lambda is an nth root of unity. That can only happen <coughs> um, if lambda is an integer. Okay? So that's what tells you <coughs> that all the characters of S1 look like z to the power n. So that, and hence, the dual group is indeed the group of integers. So more generally, the dual of a discrete group is a compact group, and the dual of a compact group is a discrete group. So now I can state a grand Pontryagin duality theorem. There is a natural isomorphism between a locally compact abelian group and its double dual, given by essentially the same thing that we had in the finite case, namely the, our friendly evaluation map, which has radiated nearly all the, the, the dualities we've seen so far. So the proof requires quite a lot of analysis. <coughs> what I hope to have conveyed is that it's kind of clear to see how, how this works in a finite case. And we have to see, therefore, what are the ingredients that have to be generalized to do all this in a more general case. There's still a lot of rolling up their sleeves and fighting with F armies of epsilons to be done. But eventually, uh, <coughs> we can show this with fairly standard technique. And in particular, Fourier theory now generalizes to arbitrary, locally compact abelian groups, not just the circle and, and Z. You might wonder, Fourier series, how does that work? Well, that's a, a self-duality between R and R. <coughs> okay, so Fourier series is, is uh, the circle and Z. For the Fourier transform that physicists love so much is the self-duality of the real line and its set. Now, <coughs> Special present for Mike Mislow. Uh, a bit about Tanaka Prime duality. What can we do if the group is not abelian? Do we just throw up our hands and give up? Well, <coughs> the basic point is one cannot work with the characters alone. Okay? That they just don't tell you everything you want to know about the group. So one needs to work with the category of representations. So for those of you who don't know representation theory, let me say a few words. If you look at a group, one useful way of studying it is to look at homomorphisms of that group into groups of matrices. Okay? So it kind of makes the group concrete, or it gives you a, a, a piece of the view of the group by looking at, uh, at certain homomorphisms into matrix groups. Now, <coughs> actually the subject is more interesting than that because 
one of the things you get by looking at these so-called representations is that you get the idea of the group actually acting on the vector space. So you can think of these as actually G modules now. Now, it turns out that for nice groups, we can actually have define a notion of what's called an irreducible representation, one that cannot be broken down into a smaller piece. And for really nice groups, these irreducible representations can be used to construct all the representations by taking sums. <coughs> for obedient groups, the only irreducible representations are in fact one-dimensional, i.e. characters. For non-obedient groups, this is absolutely not the case. Even for simple things like the permutation group, you have uh, interesting irreducible representation. In fact, to this day, people are still publishing papers on representation of the permutation group. <coughs> okay, so the point is, you need um, to look at higher dimensional matrices, not just not just uh, one dimensional one, otherwise known as numbers. So, <coughs> very important point: you don't just look at this, these representations lying around and as an incoherent bundle, they form a category. In fact, they form a nice homology category. And one needs that structure to do the analog of Montreal's inside duality. You need to look at the category of representation. So the selling category theory, this is one important thing you can uh, use to sell it. It is not just <coughs> there to give you kind of structure to your theory. Here it is being used as a plot of the algebra. So Tanaka showed how to reconstruct a compact group, not necessarily abelian, from the monoidal category of its representations. And the monoidal structure is absolutely crucial in this reconstruction. Now, you can look at uh, one of these categories and wonder, did this actually arise as a category of representations of some group or not? And try and answer that question. So he characterized the monoidal categories that arise as a category of representations of a compact group. So between them, they really gave essentially a very nice duality here. <coughs> between, but now, on the one side, you have uh, compact groups. On the other side, you have the individual things are themselves categories of representations. And if I weren't so scared of these categories, this would probably only set up as a two categorical framework. <coughs> It turns out um, you can look at these Tanaka type reconstruction theorems in other algebraic settings. So um, you can look at it, for example, for rings, which you think, might think at first sight that must be more complicated. Actually, it's almost trivial. It's a three line remark in macoverflow.net. <laughs> Except it took me like five pages to verify everything in the remark. But, uh, but all the verifications are completely simple and suitable homework question for the algebra class. So given a ring, we have an abelian category of right R modules associated with that ring. So I'm not even necessarily taking a commutative ring. <coughs> we have a forgetful functor from uh, R modules to abelian groups. Did I say this? <clears throat> so, right, you have a forgetful functor that takes you from the R modules to abelian uh, groups. And now you can look at the natural transformations of that functor and itself. Natural transformation from that functor to itself. This is certainly somewhat too categorical, but I'm terrified of this category, so I try not to talk about that. <coughs> Since abelian groups is have enriched, so is the functor category. Okay? And so, in fact, this thing is actually itself a ring. Right? And lo and behold, it is isomorphic to the ring you started with. <coughs> so actually proving this isomorphism, you can do it like the way I did it, which was couple of pages of childish calculations. Uh, or you can simply say, well, one's an enriched Yoneda, mm -hmm. the next one is this plain Yoneda, you get that more or less right away. Okay, so this is kind of a flavor.
label for a Tamaka type theorem, you start with a ring, or you start with an algebraic gadget, you look at the category of its representations, which you can think of as modules if you want, and then you can look at an appropriate forgetful functor and look at the endomorphism gadget of that uh, <coughs> of the natural transformation from that functor to itself and reconstruct the, whatever the gadget is from that. You do need the category. <coughs> okay. So it has to be categorical, it can't be done any other way. So if so here's something you can give as an exercise in your elementary category theory class. So you can do the same thing for monoids. Tanaka theorem for monoids. Mm -hmm. uh, so you look at M sets and you look at this and you can prove that this same forgetful functor, this endomorphism ring, uh, endo, sorry, endomorphism monoid is isomorphic to M. So I was really uh, impressed that such an elementary factor could be dressed up to make some sort of effort. <coughs> Now for groups, Tanaka theory is not so trivial because one has only the linear representations. And, and that's why some serious hard work has to be done to prove Tanaka theorem. So I'm not saying Tanaka duality is something so simple, but this is giving you the flavor of what these kinds of reconstruction theorems mean. So essentially we need the monoidal structure there to get back the group structure. <coughs> so closing remarks, one can relate uh, Gelfand duality and Contriazin duality, because there, are, there is a kind of Gelfand view of what I've been saying, which I've hidden from you till now. So if you take a locally compact obedient group, you can look at the uh, integrable functions. Right? We know we have a measure, our measure on that group. We can define it for integration. We can define L1 of G in the usual way. And we can make it into an algebra by using the convolution operation. In fact, it's a, <coughs> a commutative unital Banach algebra. So this is also called the group algebra of G. Okay. Now, <coughs> the point is that since you've got a commutative unital Banach algebra, you can ask what would Gelfand say about it. It turns out that there is a bijection between the Gelfand transform of L1 of G and the Pontryagin dual of G. Gelfand Contriagin uh, payoff happening here. <coughs> so let me see. Let me end with some uh, remarks about uh, more recent stuff. So in 1989, Dr. Kerr and Roberts, who are two mathematical physicists, gave a new duality theory for compact groups using notions of C star categories. And um, this is stuff that I am eager to learn, but I'm far from having understood it yet but it seems to me a fantastic new thing that is well worth uh, paying attention to. And these types of duality theorems have been generalized not just to uh, groups, but also now to quantum groups and other settings, super groups as well. <coughs> and finally, in joint work with my student who's in the audience, Costin Badescu, and also Tobias Fritz at Perimeter, and Robert Ferber, uh, who is our student, who is probably <coughs> We've been developing such theorems for certain kinds of operator algebras, for C-star algebras. Um, so, okay, I will end there. In fact, it's all the time. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Any questions? Uh, I was wondering, because it, this object and duality uh, is kind of responsible for the Fourier transform, if it is a is also responsible for the Laplace and Mellini transform, and then also somewhat if one it would be possible to construct a Mellini, a quantum Mellini transform. In well, I, mean, I don't think so. Uh, certainly, I don't think it's connected to the Laplace transform. Mm, Mellini transform. I don't see why it would be connected to that, but I, 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 I think not. And, uh, it looks very similar with these convolution. For example, um, yes, um, but I mean, that, well, so I don't know, but I've never seen that uh, mentioned. Certainly, Laplace transform doesn't look like that, right?
function as a connection between the doctor's robot duality and Tanakian duality. It's right, rather than this is a lead Tanakian duality, and then I mean, there's a nice exposition of the doctor's robots there using the lead approach. And uh -huh, by yes. expressed well yeah the way it's expressed uh, is very categorical as I said but you know, maybe there's some completely other way of doing it <laughs> yeah. well, I could imagine for example that there is no subcategory in category representations that's not what it is oh I see that kind of theorem mm -hmm. the fact that you need the whole category of representation as opposed to a subcategory present to me was <laughs> tell me about Tanaka duality. Now you want me to answer questions about it. <laughs> 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 uh, it's good you know, so I think things I can do with. <laughs> so, I mean, in the spirit of that question, though, I would say that um, the, the basis for all of this actually goes back to what's called uh, the Peter Vial theorem. Mm -hmm. that says every compact group has enough irreducible representations to separate points. And that's, if, if you want to start constructing a duality theory or some sort of, rep well, a representation theory, that's where you start. So you certainly couldn't get away with less than all of those. Well, so it's clear you need something to separate points, but maybe there's some other way of separating points. So Peter Weil says these are enough to separate points, right. but maybe, maybe let's go also do. Uh, so a theorem like what Chris wants would be nothing less than this will, will work. There is no restriction in the in, in finiteness. So, so there is no such thing such that any dimensional representation suffices. Right. And it can be shown, I think. I mean, you only need to define the category of representations. You can define that in some very minimal way, then. Sure. Yeah. So it's unambiguous to refer to that one and not some other one. doing what Chris really wants. <laughs> but I mean, like That's just giving a sort of more compact view regarding the kind of presentation of the, that category of representation. Chris, can you go a few slides back to what you called Tanaka's theory about the modules, uh, module match uh, to yes, yes. This one. This one, yes. Okay. I'm trying to look at it from a Gantt-Orpel perspective. Now the, and, and the, the, the Abelian groups are modules of a So, can you generalize this to an arbitrary structure between R1 modules and R2 modules? And um, you see what I'm trying to say? And the next, next question then is both categories are, of course, either both more or two as of a monad. And can uh -huh. even be generalized to this level? Sorry, but what are R1 and R2 modules? And the, the two different rings. Oh, I see. Two different rings. Okay, yeah. yeah. R1 and R2. Okay, yeah. yes. And and basically, like you have here, although one is fixed to be the integers. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And the next generalization, can you formulate it in terms of what I'm both more catchy? Well, I think I absolutely not thought of. Okay. I'm expecting a paper by you on this shortly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know. Let's forget for point of view, we try to send a book, so yes. that means all these natural transformations should just fall from the new. <coughs> yeah, so that's what I said. Yes. Yeah, so you have, uh, I mean, right, that's why they're, for example, natural and not monoidal now. Right. Okay. In the case of monoids, M sets is different from monoidal. Mm -hmm. So you can do it there. Sorry, I didn't actually check this one. Thanks, Prakash. Yeah.